Hey everyone, my name is Aparna. Um, I'm the co-founder of Mechanism Labs. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit about a paper which we wrote called the meta-analysis of alternative consensus protocols. So to start off with, what are alternative consensus protocols? Basically anything that's outside of the family of proof of work um, is regarded as an alternative consensus protocol. Um, so a lot of people start out by believing that proof of work has been proven. But if you start to think about it, the scale at which proof of work has been proven um, is still very small. All the promises of the blockchain um, of like building these huge economies on top of it, um, we're nowhere near any of these. And if you think of where Bitcoin is or where Ethereum is today, um, and you try to scale that up, like enough to meet all these promises of the blockchain, you'll start to realize that proof of work is not the protocol that's capable of doing that. Because proof of work is highly wasteful of energy. Bitcoin itself uses as much energy as the country of Iceland, and now you try to scale that up, um, that's not going to be very energy efficient. And if we are building the protocols of the future, we need to be building the efficient protocols of the future. Um, a lot of people also argue that proof of work actually provides a sort of security. What they actually mean by that is that proof of work serves as the civil control mechanism and prevents people from creating multiple identities of themselves. Um, and you can essentially mimic this sort of property that proof of work provides with any other civil control mechanism that's much faster and helps you get to consensus much faster. Um, and so far, a lot of the proof of work families of protocols have this sort of um, myth of the immutable blockchain. So how many of you have been told that the blockchain is actually immutable? Well, do you believe that? Because today's blockchain is not. You can have a fork and the blockchain can change its history right from the day one. Um, so enter proof of stake. The way I see proof of stake is I see it as an alternative to proof of work in terms of a civil control mechanism. And 2018 has been a year of several proof of stake protocols. Um, so we decided to write a paper comparing all these different protocols on a framework that makes sense. Um, and the reason we chose these specific protocols is because they had papers um, and had enough of progress that we could actually academically analyze them and do justice to them. So why is this sort of a framework important in the first place? Well, if you are a developer or if you are an investor or if you're someone who's trying to understand the blockchain space, how do you even begin to go about understanding it? What protocol is the best? What do you build on top of? Um, there exists no objectively best protocol. It's really hard for you to weed through all the noise that you see. Um, you're gonna have a lot of people on Twitter, on Reddit, and all of these social media platforms telling you why their protocol is the best. But how do you go about analyzing that for yourself and justifying that for yourself? What's What's really interesting though, is for very specific use cases and for very specific philosophies, there do exist best protocols. And it's important for you to have this framework so that you can figure out what the best protocol for yourself is. Um, and if you're entering the research space or if you're thinking of building applications on any of these different projects, it's important for you to know what your options are. Um, if you're trying to make the next big breakthrough, isn't it kind of important that you know what's already been done so you can do it even better? So, so far I've talked about why the framework's important and given you a little bit of background about it. Um, now I'm gonna actually talk about the framework. So, something to keep in mind through the rest of the talk is I'm sort of tying this consensus framework with use cases that these different protocols will enable and how their design decisions um, help them or help you build very specific use cases on top of these protocols. 
Um, so something you want to keep in mind is you think about what degree of permissioned or permissionless use cases you want on these different protocols as you approach them, and that will essentially determine which one you choose. So something you always want to think about when looking at any new protocol is the model. The model is basically the setting or the environment that the protocol um, assumes, or like certain sets of assumptions that the protocol designer make that if you break, the protocol no longer can function. Um, and the first of this model is the network model. The network model basically means um, what can you assume about messages that are being sent between different people or different nodes in the network? Is there an upper bound on the time that it takes for messages to get transmitted? Um, do you know what this upper bound on time is? And all of these different decisions basically relate to how permissioned or permissionless the protocol is. So for example, if you're building a sort of blockchain use case for your very specific company, but you have fiber, fiber optic cables connecting all these different nodes and servers, maybe you can have a synchronous protocol because you can assume that messages are going to be delivered and you're guaranteed that this is gonna happen in a fixed amount of time. On the other hand, if you're building something on the public internet, if you're building the next cryptocurrency, you wanna lean to something that's as asynchronous as possible. The second most important property with any model is the adversarial model. Um, and the adversarial model basically is how long does it take an adversary to knock down servers on your protocol? Um, this could be instantaneous, this could be never, or it could be somewhere in between, maybe it takes some amount of time. And again, if you have some sort of like a consortium where you know everyone has access everyone in the world has access to your protocol data, then maybe you want something that tolerates a much stronger adversary. On the other hand, if you have a more permission use case, then you probably can tolerate a weaker adversary. And finally, the economic model. The economic model basically tells you, are there any incentives that the system has built? Um, and one very strong feature that you want in any protocol is for it to be incentive compatible, which basically means every honest action has to be protocol following and should be the Nash equilibrium for participants. Now, if you have a public chain, it makes sense and you actually do need an economic incentive. On the other hand, if you have a permission chain, you don't have a need for an economic model because maybe the people running the servers have an intrinsic, an intrinsic incentive to run servers because they want the data. Um, so, so far we've talked about the model. Let's talk a little bit about the framework. And this framework, although we used to analyze these different protocols, you can use to analyze basically any consensus protocol out there in the world. So the first is proposer and committee election. So who proposes blocks, who adds and creates blocks in the network, and who does this process of verifying the blocks that were added to the network? The second is propagation. How do these different people who add blocks and verify blocks in the network communicate with each other? Does everyone talk to everyone? Does one person talk to another person who then talks to another person? Um, what sort of messages or message complexity does the network have? And the third is finality. Um, so once a block is added to your blockchain, is there a permanent record of it? Is there any chance at all that this block can be removed from the blockchain? Or uh, there can be a change of history? How hard is this change of history? Um, and does having this change of history mean you're abiding by the rules of the protocol? Or does the protocol fail out if you have this sort of fork or change in history. And finally, it's this property of handling churn, um, which basically means, are the different people who are part of your network capable of leaving and joining as they please, when they please? So if you think of Bitcoin, for example, any of the miners can join 
in and be part of the protocol at any given point of time. And they can also leave at any given point of time. But that's not necessarily true of very different proof of stake protocols. Um, and this handling churn property is really interesting and important because um, if you're not, if, if you have a public permission chain, you want to be able to handle a huge flux in people joining and leaving and acting in any arbitrary manner as you please. On the other hand, if you have some sort of a permission consortium, you, you can sort of narrow down on who the people are who are going to even be part of your protocol, um, who are going to join or leave and um, maybe even just remain. And you may not need to handle as much of a churn. So, um, so far we talked about the framework itself, but when we talk about different people in the network communicating with each other, if everyone talks to everyone, that's way too many messages. Um, and there's no way your protocol will reach consensus or agreement in a scalable, quick manner. Um, and that's where randomness comes in. Oftentimes, people use some sort of randomness source to figure out who is going to be the proposer or the creator of the block and who is going to be the verifier. Um, and some really good properties of any randomness scheme that you want is you want it to be not predictable, not biasable. So that basically means you don't want anyone either in protocol or out of protocol to know what the randomness seed is ahead of time, nor do you want any of these people to have the capability of tampering what this randomness seed is ahead of time. Um, and finally, you don't want this randomness seed to be revealed ahead of time. So this ties very closely with how permission or permissionless your protocol is, because if you know the randomness seed ahead of time, you can determine who the people in the committee are or who the block proposers and verifiers are, and you can essentially attack them and cause them to go offline um, by denial of serving them, uh, denial of serv uh, service attacking them. Um, so randomness is another very important property that that's used to sort of narrow down who is part of this committee of communication. Um, so in conclusion, we looked at all of these different protocols across all of these different parameters. Um, and the different decisions that they made in terms of network model and randomness model um, and other subtle things in terms of how they went about achieving them essentially gave, um, gave weight to these different results and conclusions of the protocols. So finality guaranteed basically means um, is achieving a finalized history a necessity in the protocol? Can the protocol tolerate forks? Um, the second thing of handling churn is basically can people move in and out of the network? And the third is network partition resolution. So there's a very famous theorem called the CAP theorem, which basically says in the case of any internet partition, you can either be consistent or available, but definitely not both, which basically means Either your protocol can be online and keep adding values, but it's likely that these values can change later. Or um, you can pause your protocol right now, and everyone has the same view of it, but you're not going to add anything new until um, the network has resolved its partition. Now, all of these different properties give rise to very different use cases that different protocols can enable. So if, for example, you're having a payment system, you might want a more consistent protocol. In the case of like the internet going down, you don't necessarily want false payments getting added to the network. On the other hand, if you're building some sort of live streaming application, maybe you're okay with some data being added and you're okay with things changing as long as the protocol is still alive. And you can sort of tolerate some of the data being removed and changed. Um, but what protocol is the best is up to you to decide based on your need and your use case. And this framework was supposed to enable 
all of you to do that for yourselves. So if you have any questions, come talk to me after the presentation. Um, you can also read more about finality and randomness on the Mechanism Labs blog. Thank you. Thank you.